Hello dear influential leaders, welcome to another episode of the Influential Executive Podcast. Today I have the oldest guest ever on the podcast. This is in a bit over 50 episodes, Mr. Harold Taylor. Harold is 85 years old and he's alive and kicking. He's been a time management expert for over 50 years. He's president of Harold Taylor Time Consultants, now operating as Taylor in Time. He wrote over 20 books, developed over 50 time management products, among which there's a planner. And during the interview, you will hear why this planner is so important to him. We speak about many things. Most of all, what I really liked about this conversation is that we learn how Harold built his career as an influencer in the time when there was no internet yet. So how did that work? How did he sell information products? How did he figure out which products to create? How to sell them? How to speak about them? You will see that much of what he learned decades ago still applies today. So here you go. Enjoy the episode with Harold Taylor. Mr. Harold Taylor, welcome to the Influential Executive Podcast. Thank you, Alan Vander. <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> You're a time management expert and you have been managing time for a very, very long time with 85 years. You are the oldest guest that I ever had on the podcast this far. So I'm excited to learn about all the wisdom you gathered along the way. (laughs) Well, sometimes wisdom comes with age, but sometimes just old age comes with age, you know, so (laughs) it it might vary. I'm somewhere in between, I think, probably. You you did pick up some wisdom along the way. I did, indeed. And some of it I retained as well. (laughs) Uh, That's the secret as you grow older. (laughs) When did your affinity or maybe I can say obsession with time management begin? Wow, I guess it's back. Well, my first company was in 1967. I started up a a company while I taught at Humber College in Toronto. And uh, I guess uh, during those first 10 years or so in my own business is when I uh, became interested in it. I started doing seminars, training, and uh, typically uh, everybody at the time and uh, probably most people still do they pick certain topics and they do uh, training on time management leadership creativity memory training you know and i did those kind of things and then i thought wow there's so much to know about all of these things you cannot be an expert in more than one topic so i made the decision okay what will still be around 50 years from now because then I was in my 30s. So I thought either time management or stress will both be around 50, 60, or 100 years from now. <laughs> so I picked time management and uh, never looked back because, yes, it's still even more important now with all the interruptions and, and digital technology and, and uh, so on that we have to cope with. Oh, um, yes. It's just unbelievable. You know, before we could walk out of the office. And people couldn't get a hold of us until we got home, you know, where there was a phone. Now, when you walk out of the office, the office walks with you. You know, it's on your hip uh, in terms of an iPhone or or some other digital device. And when you're driving, it's there as well. When you're sleeping, people sleep with it on their bedside table and use it for alarm clocks and answer it. And they're online before they even get out of bed in the morning. So there's all kinds of problems, interruptions and uh, time wasters that you have to cope with today that we never coped with 50 years ago. Yeah. What is it that excites you about time management that has got, kept you going for 50 years oh, on yeah, this one topic? Indeed. Yeah, I, I, I love time management because time is life. Uh, and a lot of people say, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. Uh, you've got time for anything you want to do. But I say anything, not everything. You know, I can do anything, but I can't do everything. Yeah. And so I've got to pick out the any things that are important to me. They're the priorities in my life. What do I want to spend the time on? And it's amazing what people can accomplish if they 
you know, follow the rules such as the 80-20 rule where 80% of your results come from 20% of the things you do. Let's focus on that 20% then. We can eliminate the other 80% uh, and still, you know, get <laughs> most of it done. So, uh, yeah, it's a it's a real big thing. It's a big thing. It's a, it encompasses so much, I, uh, even more than I realized at the time. Goal setting is part of it. Planning is part of it. Getting organized is part of it, although that's broken off as a separate discipline now, but it's part and parcel of time management. Yeah. The only thing between organizing and time management is organizing your organizing things, whereas with time, you're organizing time. So, <laughs> and you have to have both. Exactly, exactly. And with organizing being a separate discipline, uh, do you refer to the getting things done method? Um, well, getting things done is, uh, to me, is time management because then you're, you're, you're getting things done within, within that time frame. But organizing to me is, look, at, I've got to know where to reach to get my water. <laughs> you know, I got to know where my pen is. I, got, I, I don't want to spend time searching for things. If I open my drawer, you know, then I want to know that's where my staples are or what have you. I want to know where my computer paper is. I want it to, you know, near the computer. I want my, <laughs> I want things organized so that I don't waste time uh, looking for things. The same thing in your home. You know, you, you don't want to spend time looking all over the house for where did I put the scissors? You know. <laughs> so that's why I, I, I separate it by in terms of the organizing is your environment, whereas time management is yourself. And it's not time management. Not is is not uh, managing time. You can't manage time anyway. It's funny we call it that. You can't manage time. You can only manage yourself and what you do in the time that you have available. Yeah. And people have different amounts of time available yeah. as well. And um, with the time that you had available in the past, you decided to write over twenty books and develop over 50 time management products yes well it evolved you know i i looked at it and thought well my first uh, when i decided that i would do time management i thought okay well i've got to have a goal you know i can't just go around giving seminars on time management reading up about time management regurgitating what i learned uh what, what's my goal and i thought well if i'm going to be successful in time management then I've got to stick to time management, number one, because you can't be an expert in everything. And I found out in, in Canada, at least, uh, everybody and their uncle does time management, but they also do stress management, leadership styles, and so on and so forth. And I thought if some uh, meeting planner calls uh, once a time management, you know, you don't, you can, you can't force topics down a person's throat. There has to be a need first. So if one company says, let's get in some training, what do we need? Well, I think time management, you know, that'll get more out of the workers and so on. We'll be more organized. Okay, well, who do we get? Well, there are thousands of people in Canada, hundreds of thousands of people maybe that do time management. But there's only one or two that do nothing but time management. So who would you hire? The person who does 17 things or the person who does one thing? And when I join the associations, the uh, speaking associations and so on, they would say, well, yeah, but what happens once IBM call you and they, you've done time management for them, uh, what else do you have to give them? You know, they'll only hire you once. And I said, well, I'll tell you one thing. I'd rather have I, uh, a, a new audience. <laughs> you know, I can get all kinds of audiences, but I only have to have prepare one speech. Now it's not a speech, you know, I did mostly training, but then it did evolve into <coughs> half an hour and 20 minute talks and so on, on, on time management. But I wanted to be, I, I said, I'm going to have a goal of 10 years from now, I'll be the top authority on time management in Canada. Now that's not a matter of ego. It's a matter of having something to aim at. I'd be happy if I just, you know, made enough money to get around to get, get along. That's all. It's my lifestyle. I love doing it. I do it for nothing if I can afford to. Now I can afford to, so I do it for nothing, you know, quite yeah. frankly. <laughs> but uh, uh, and then I, I, I did. So I said, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of organizations around. 
in time management that, that, that I can give it to for time management. So I never look back. Then, of course, there's been the larger companies have you back every few months to train, you know, the, the banks and so on. And uh, uh, different organizations would have a regular training program, so they, they hire you as well. Then I thought, and I find out that some people, though, they have their own trainers. They have their own training department. Okay, but do they have their training instruments then? So I developed some things like the getting organized self-analysis quiz and uh, uh, you know uh, stress-related things and so on and so forth. So I developed some. That's where products came in. Uh, proper use of a planner. There was no planner out there that would work the way I wanted it to work. So I developed my own planner, created it, and sold it for I guess it was going for 18, 20 years before I uh, finally you know dropped it. Uh, uh, just two years ago, actually, <laughs> we published our own planner. And uh, so anyway, you know, once I had the goal, I thought, well, okay, so let's say I'm visualizing now, and this is what you have to do. It's now 10 years in the future, uh, and I'm the top time management expert. What will I be doing? What will I look like? What will I have with me? And so on. How will I dress even, you know? Uh, and I thought, wow, well, one thing is I'd, I'd have to have a book. Because, you know, if you don't have a book, you're not an expert. You know, if I have a book and I'm an author, they think I know what I'm talking about, whether I do or I don't. Right. So, yeah. so I, I'm going to have to have to have a book and uh, it may not be a bestseller, but at least it'll be something on the topic I have. How, and then, well, that's an overwhelming task. That's a goal in itself. How do you write a book? And I said, well, I don't have the self-discipline right now myself to sit down or the time to write a book. So I'll write articles. And so my first book, believe it or not, Alexander, was a series of articles. What I did is I wrote articles for something called Toronto Business, I believe it was, and the free, you know, I give you these free articles, 800 word articles, and I'll do it uh, every week, it was a weekly. And uh, when I got up to 36 articles and stuff, I wrote them as though I'm writing a book. And I was uh, just with putting a little, uh, you know, uh, connection between one article and the other, each one becomes a chapter. So I end up with three articles per chapter, 12 chapters, 36 articles. It became making time work for you. And then I had to get a publisher for it. Now I could self publish, but that doesn't have the credibility that going through a publisher has, you know? Uh, so I, and I, and I wanted exposure. That's another thing I had on my list of things. I have to get exposure visibility. I have interviews on TV, radio, you get that through a book. So I got a book uh, published by a, a Beaufort, New York, and uh, General Publishing in uh, Toronto that simultaneously published it. It was in a hardcover. It went over well. Uh, I had a hard job getting it published because they thought it was too short. You know, they should fill it with anecdotes and stuff, which is crazy. I'm not going to do that. So I sent it to another publisher. So I might have sent it to three or four publishers first. But I was really lucky. I, I, it got published. And they went in the hard copy and then soft copy, and then they reprinted it. And then they sold the rights to, in Waco, Texas, to the SMI tapes, you know, so the recording, it was recorded. And then it went to a pocketbook, Dell pocketbook, and became a pocketbook as well. So it, it happened to do well. And that got me a lot of interviews on radio and TV. So they'd ask me, where are you going to speak? Okay, could you go here or there and somewhere else, you know, and do uh, have an interview as well, which I did, which didn't do any harm. So it sort of, uh, you know, sort of grew from there. It was, uh, and, and all the money I got initially, by the way, went into doing this be because I looked like an expert when I was nothing, when I started on the day one, because I said, well, an expert would have a nice brochure, you know, uh, like a, in fact, a, I visualize a, uh, like a fold out folder with the information in there, past clients and so on. Well, I didn't have many past clients, so the types, Type was pretty large, you know, about 24 types. <laughs> and then it went all the way down to 10 and 9, you know, type to get it all on one page. And then I categorized it as into institutions and education and uh, associations and so on and so forth. So it became, as it grew, it became more and more impressive. And then the book came out, it became part of the press kit. So when a, uh, a company would call and I say, well, let me send you the press kit, you know, it has information on me. and some of the experiences I've had in my education and so on. Oh, okay, great. And then they get it and wow, there's a book in there. Uh, that's just a pretty expensive business card, isn't it? Well, I had a deal with the publisher. I could buy them at 50% discount, you know, so it wasn't really that much of a, 
uh, of a thing because I'm, I'm charging a lot, which is another thing you have to put your price up or they'll think you're no good, you know. I learned that from some, uh, I think I did the one for, uh, uh, what was a company in, in Tennessee, Federal Express. And uh, he hired me because we met at an NSA meeting, National Speakers Association meeting in the States. And uh, and he said, oh, do you do? Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand you do seminars. Yeah, well, we need some too. He was the vice president of marketing or whatever it was. And uh, so I said, yeah, great. And then he phoned me and he said, Harold, uh, what did you say your fee was? And I said, uh, $750 you know, for, the, for a full day seminar, you know? He said, well, Harold, I'm, you know, I'm going to have a hard sell for that. I thought he was that I was going to cost too much. He said, you know, we're used to paying, you know, thousand, three, you know, up to three thousand dollars for speakers. Would you mind uh, revising that to, to fifteen hundred dollars? You know, <laughs> so you know, it looked like you're you, you're you're as good as you are. You know, <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, yeah, I'd consider that. I guess. <laughs> so that's when I learned that hey, when you, uh, yeah, I put my fee up slightly every year. And, uh, you know, and uh, it's great. And at one point you leave one set of clients behind and you gain a newer set of clients, maybe a Fortune 500 group or whatever. So it, 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 it worked out well. It worked out well. Um, and, I, and, I, and you have to, if you're managing your time, you have to practice what you preach. It's just one of the things that anybody who's, uh, I tell people, what's an influencer? Well, an influencer is somebody who, who motivates somebody to either make a behavioral change or to apply implement certain strategies or to do whatever. And if I'm going to uh, motivate people to make changes in their workplace, then I've got to be in a position that I'm a, a role model you know, as well. So, um, so that this, this is what, uh, what I did is I thought, well, okay, how would I manage my time? Well, I'm not going to do seminars on Sunday. I mean, Sunday's a time for me, me not, well, for my God, myself, my family. I mean, it's not uh, work time for me. And uh, so, and you've got time for re re rejuvenation and self-renewal and so on. So I'm going to put, put down, and when anybody asks me to do one on a Sunday, I'm sorry, I don't do seminars on Sunday. You turn down $5,000, you know, for, <laughs> you won't work on a Sunday? Well, of course, because time is very important. Time is light, you know. i got to keep my health up and so on and so forth. So I... I never do that. I would do two uh, two evenings a week because I don't don't want to be on the rubber chicken circuit, you know, where you're going to dinner meetings all the time and they think you're doing a favor because you're feeding you uh, baked chicken or something, and you're sitting there and you're away from your family every night of the week and flying all over the the country. No, so you decide in advance what it is you want. See, because I'm now 15 or 10 years in the future, and I'm successful, so I can. You know, write my own ticket kind of thing so I'm gonna write my ticket now and uh, I know I my first employee was somebody I hired to to sell me because I wasn't good at selling myself you know because you sound like you're bragging you know <laughs> so so uh, I hired some and she said well Harold why don't you why don't you work Sundays until you get some more clients and you can afford to and then you can give it up and I said you know uh, Joan if I if I did that <coughs> if I worked on Sundays and I was on a regular, I wouldn't want to give it up because I'd be making this money and I'd hate to give up the money. Uh, I'd be, it'd be costing me money, but heck now I don't have any anyway, so I'm not giving up anything, right? So it worked out good anyway. So I had certain policies like that and that's why I always tell people to do. In your planner, and that's why I made my own planner because I've always used, at that time even, I used a Covatus minister style planner because it was a Good size. Where is it? No. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a good size, and uh, you know it has a, a, a week at a glance and so on. And this is what I like. But it had nothing in the front in terms of what are your goals, what are your personal policies, and so on. You know, and uh, and what are the deadline dates of these goals? And I wanted to set a goal, set several goals in different areas of my life. I wanted to be in writing uh, because putting them in writing, even now, it sensitizes your mind to it when you put things in writing. Yeah. If you just have it on, a, on an iPhone, you never look at it, you know, because you're interested in other things on the iPhone. Well, I've got my goals on my iPhone. You ever seen them in the last seven months? Well, no, because I've never, you know, but I, I certainly saw my directory and all that other stuff. 
and my appointments and stuff, but I never saw my goals. I want to be able to open my planner and there staring me are my goals. And I made a promise to myself that each week I would do something that would lead me to one of those goals. And, uh, you know, and when the goal is reached, I check it off. And uh, hopefully, you know, sometimes I didn't get all six goals or seven goals done, but most of the time I did. And that's another thing, a uh, tip on time management, don't set too many goals. Because if you set all these goals, they become like a to-do list, you know, when you cross off the easy ones, the ones you like to do, the ones that represent other people's priorities and, you know, and what's left are the ones that are really important and meaningful. So I say, no, just try and limit to five or six major goals. The other things you can put on a to-do list, that means a to-do list is no commitment on a to-do list. And that's a problem with it, you know, but there is a commitment in a goal. If you take that goal, and say, well, if I'm going to write a book, let's say, or if I'm going to uh, do this uh, policy or, or develop this new product, and uh, and I've got six months to do it, because I want to have it introduced by September or whatever it happens to be, then how much time do I have to spend each week in order to get it done? And they say, oh, you have to spend five hours a week. Oh, I can't afford five hours a week. Okay, then make it for the following September then. and. Uh, it's going to take you, what, uh, oh, three hours a week. Okay, three hours a week I can handle. And then schedule, log off the time as an appointment with yourself to get it done. The things that we get done are the thing commitments we make to other people, appointments. Mm-hmm. I've got to see you know, Alexander because he wants to talk to me on this podcast you know, on a certain day. Uh, I've, got to, I've got to be, uh, oh, I'm supposed to have coffee at, uh, at uh, Starbucks with such and such on a certain time. I mark those things in my planner, and guess what? I'm at Starbucks. I'm at my desk ready to talk to Alexander. I, I'm, I'm with that client. I'm, I'm with that associate who wants to talk to me about something that I don't even know what he wants to talk about. Those are the things we commits we keep. And what are our, our things? Our things are in to-do lists. If I have time, I'll work on something that will further my career, my life, my health, my family. You know? And I'd say you've got to have as much respect for your own time as you have for other people's time. And that means that you come first. And, you, and, you, and so you block off, but I'm not going to block off three hours. Why? Well, three hours, can you imagine how many interruptions I get in three hours? I'd interrupt myself in three hours. Somebody walk in and say, Harold, can I interrupt you? Oh, yeah, thank God. Yeah, I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm on this book, you know. Uh, and so I say 90 minutes is a maximum. That I, put. I say 90 minutes for a reason because over the years I realized that this cycle that goes in your sleep where you know you go, uh, you can wake up easily after every 90 minutes and so on and so forth. It's energy cycles. Those cycles go through the whole day, too. I'm high energy in the morning, and then I go to drift down again, and I go up higher again, and I go drift down again. So 90 minutes is good. In 90 minutes, I don't have to check email for 90 minutes. I've never seen a person that I have associated with that could not wait 90 minutes to get a response from me. I'm very important to them. And uh, so I will not check email in, so there's no interruptions there. I'm not going to make a phone call. I'll put my cell phone, which I've done now, by the way, before I talk talking to you, on airplane mode because I'm not going to talk to anybody while I'm talking to you. And I bet you I don't miss one, lose one friend, one client, uh, you know, uh, because I'm doing that. But I'm focused and I'm getting more done. And uh, this is what I think time management is all about. It's not, you know, uh, I don't have time for this. Yes, you do. If you don't do other things like interruptions. And you read books on, on, on time management. I read over a thousand I got rid of at one time. And now I'm reading books on the brain because uh, the time, uh, and I'm changing my focus because if you're supposed to be an expert in time management, then you keep up with the trends and something new. And people never heard of holistic time management. What's that all about? You know, never heard of that before. Oh, it's very important. That's my, that's the new thing, you know, and that's digital age. And uh, executive skills, what do you mean executive skills? Well, they're the ones, the skill, the brain-based skills that reside in the prefrontal cortex. And uh, they're the ones that actually keep you focused and, and so on. And that's what ADHD is, is, is weakness of these skills. So you're interrupting yourself, you're, you're not focused, you're easily distracted and, and so on. So you keep up to date on those things. And what I try to do as I go along is I, okay, I'm gonna practice, experiment on myself, you know, to see what works and what doesn't work, and then write about it. And then they'll say, gee, that's the first time I've read that. You know, and uh, that keeps you 
and, and the reputation of being an authority on the, on the topic. I'd like to ask you a big time management question. This is about how to grow older without growing old. Oh, yes. And particularly I'm interested because recently I heard that with all technological changes going on and improvements in healthcare and preventative healthcare, millennials are estimated to become 100 to 120 years old. Well, I'm 34 now, still have, already have quite a lifetime behind me and there's still many years to come. So what can we millennials start doing today to prepare for growing old without growing old? That's right. And uh, you know why I say without growing old, because there are some people, uh, there people are living longer, you're saying, but sometimes they're not really living longer. They're just taking longer to die uh, because they are actually in, in wheelchairs and they're invalids. They can't walk and they don't want to walk, in fact. And, uh, and there are certain things you can do in Israel, 12, 15 things you can do. And that's what I described in the book. Uh, because I found I came here to New Brunswick, and New Brunswick is what the provinces, one of the provinces with the largest life expect, uh, longest life expectancy. It's nothing to see a, a person 98 walks, you know, by a, by my my place in the morning, you know, and uh, going for her walk. And uh, uh, and so there's it's a it's a it's a great place to you know to say wow, how everybody wants to be able be healthy of course they start too late they should start when they're in their 30s and 40s and and even 50s but one thing that uh, that, that helps of course and you may or may not be able to influence and that is greenery you know uh, open spaces plants in your office and so on and when i was in toronto and i read about uh, the impact that uh, these have on your health I mean, trees and plants not only give off oxygen, but they're like vacuum cleaners and they suck all the toxins from the air and, uh, you know, take it down to their roots and so on and so forth. And they have it in hospitals and they have all kinds of trials and tests and, and uh, studies that you can read about that show you that if you put uh, if you, uh, people in a hospital with a view of a garden or, or greenery, you know, just the sight of it and everything else, they lead, need less pain medication. They they heal faster, they reduce from the hospital faster, which costs the hospital, you know, cuts the hospital costs and so on and so forth. It's just, a, it's a fact of life. And I remember, it's really funny, I could write a, write a comic book on this one, because I was in a condo in uh, Toronto and my wife passed away six years ago. And uh, so I'm alone in this condo and I'm in a, a, in a spare bedroom and it doesn't even have a window. It's not a bedroom. It was actually, well, that's yeah, a bedroom. But in a condo, you know, they don't have windows in every room. <laughs> and there's no window in it. And here I am in this you know, dark thing with artificial light trying to, trying to work. And there is a, a, an atrium, like a, 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 not an atrium, but a, like a, what do you call them? The, 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 the windows, you know, that are bay windows with all this window sunshine coming in and light. And you can see the, the trees that they've done in the, in the, beyond the parking lot and all that stuff. So I moved into that to be, you know, and, and gee, being in the, in the fresh, uh, in the air and sunlight, of course, it, it releases serotonin in the, in the body, which is the feel good hormone. You feel good, you know, and, and if you feel good, you feel more productive as well. And, uh, and it, it's actually you know, healthy for you, you have less stress and so on. And then I put plants out on the balcony, but I couldn't grow a plant without killing it. So I put all artificial plants out there because they say that if you just look at greenery and even paintings, I got a painting up there in front of me that you can't see uh, of uh, just trees and uh, a trail and so on and so forth. Uh, just looking at them, uh, it helps as well. And that's just that, that's just one thing though. And then there's relationships, you know, we're so busy, we don't have time for relationships and for people and for friends. And, and yet you, you on your life expectancy scale, you can see it's almost like a, like it would definitely a correlation between the number of friends you have, close friends that you meet with and talk with and so on, and how long you live. It's a, there's groups that uh, I go to, a, it's a, the coffee shop here is called Tim Hortons. It's closest by in Canada. There's Tim Hortons all around, just like Starbucks. And uh, I, I have, uh, I, 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 go, well, I have a, a routine and that's one thing you should develop in order to get at this thing is you develop routines and routines become habits. 
and they don't take and consume much energy and it's easy so if you want to get into good habits you can actually tack something that you'd like to get done onto that habit so i felt have built over the years a habit of walking every morning. Not even walking every morning, but stopping in at Tim Horton's coffee shop and having a coffee. And then, and uh, you've probably read the books that you can read this on that the, the actually sounds of a coffee shop are are more conducive to creativity than than solitary being solitary in a room and so on. You get the energy from the people around you, and they're not they don't know me, so they're not talking to me. But I see the same group all along, you know. I mean, every every morning, and I talk to the group, you know, and they get to they get to know me. I write a column for the local newspaper here, and uh, and uh, so, you know, and so we have a little chat and so on, and it's it's really neat, uh, and and that's that's healthy. And I had a birth, my 85th birthday party I had about a month ago, last well, July 13th, my birthday, and in Toronto I said. If I invited all my friends to my birthday party, I'd probably have six people show up. You know, <laughs> I got more friends than that. I think I must have at least twelve. <laughs> but uh, but they're too busy, you know, to come just to a birthday party. I had 120 some people come out to my birthday party in Sussex, New Brunswick. Because, and that, that I didn't put an ad in the paper. It's just talking to the different groups I'm involved with, the Chamber of Commerce and the, the church that I go to, and uh, and uh, you know, Silver Rattles Friendship Club. I join a friendship club. I've got all kinds of all kinds of friends. You say, how do you have time for them? Well, my gosh, they give you time because I have more energy now at 85 than I had when I was at 65. So it's not something that you know. If you're fortunate enough to survive, and I survived cancer, I survived gallbladder, I survived double hernia, I survived brain surgery, I survived a lot of things. Uh, and if you can survive those things, it's not too late to start. And if people say, well, I haven't got the energy to walk. Well, walking will give you energy. Just do a little bit at a time. Do it gradually, one block, then two blocks, and so on. Yeah, well, I can't even uh, get up. Then wiggle, you know, move. Because uh, the, the, there's a correlation between how long you live and sitting, too. If I sit here for six hours a day, I'm killing myself on the installment plan. So there's friendships. There's uh, exercise, moving. And there's, there's greenery and, and uh, of that. There's music as well. Music has been known to not only make you more creative, but more more relaxed, what have you. And all of this stuff affects the brain. Uh, and uh, the brain is, is 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 plastic. You know, they used to think that the brain you're wired a certain way, and some people are wired differently than others. Well, we're still wired differently than others, but but we can whatever way we're wired, we can change it. We can change the connections in our brain. You know, we are not our brain. In fact, I believe that wholeheartedly I don't even think it's a part of the brain myself uh, the mind that is you know and that's who I am I'm my mind and I can control my brain my brain is a computer that was uh, you know invested in me you know by the creator I, I was created with this brain and it's a fantastic computer but it's you know garbage in garbage out the old giggle thing too you know what am I gonna say to my brain you know I'm going to say, by gosh, I'm happy, because laughing and happy and humor, that's another uh, plus. I mean, look at all the comedians that have lived to be 100. I mean, it was, it was, uh, Bing Crosby didn't make it, but he died playing golf. But his buddy Bob, uh, Bob Hope was 100 uh, uh, when he died. And so, so was uh, George Burns. In fact, George Burns had a purpose in life. He said, I can't, when he was very, in his 80s, my age, he was saying, I can't, uh, I, I can't, uh, die he says i'm booked at the palladium in london on my 100th birthday he's got he has a purpose for a living even if it's just to be 100 and he lived to be 100 he had to cancel that appointment by the way and in fact my daughter-in-law's grandmother out in uh, uh, in uh, calgary calgary uh, the west uh, west part of canada I, I visited her in a nursing home when i wrote this book i interviewed different people in nursing homes as well and uh, and uh, Jennifer, my daughter, daughter-in-law said, uh, uh, "Grandma, why don't you sh sh uh, show Harold your uh, your jam jar?" Well, she had a jam jar because uh, she was 90, uh, 97, I guess, at the time, and she had a jam a jam jar. And they said, she said, "Well, Smuckers, put your picture on this jam jar when you get to be a hundred. So she had made up this jam jar with her picture on it. And the date of when she'll be 100, and she has it there, you know, in her 
little uh, cabinet where she keeps the, the chinaware and so on and so forth, where everybody can see it with the glass doors and so on and so forth. Yeah, she's going to make a hundred. And I understood she she ran the uh, seniors Olympics. I, I don't know what they did. I guess they raced down the hallway with her walkers or something. I'm not <laughs> sure what she do, but uh, she organized the Olympics, and she's still active. Being active mentally, so important. In other words, lifelong learning never stops. I still go to seminars. I read like crazy. I've got, well, 2,000 books, I guess, in my office now. I have to keep getting rid of some of the ones because uh, I don't have room for them. And I'm in an apartment now in Sussex, and the floor will collapse, I guess, from the weight. So, But I'm always reading as well. And, you know, even doing crossword puzzle, being active. You get older, spend time with people who are younger. Uh, I could go on, but I, you know, it's a, it's a book, uh, you know. <laughs> it's a, uh, but there's so many things you can do, and the time to, to do it is to make time for these things because they free up time. That's what people don't don't realize. They do I, more. I can get more done in an hour than I used to in a in a, in a half a day because of focus and because of experience you've got along the way. Because you keep all the things you never, th- you know, people say throw things out. I taught at Humber College for eight years. I don't have one of those lectures. And yet I used to study over the books and everything else and then present this nice lecture to the students. And then I said, well, I won't need it now. You know, my gosh, I could, I got I had enough there. I could put another 10 books. So when you create something, you say, well, how can this be used later? There's no, like I, I think I mentioned uh, something, and I said some of my favorite little quotes is that you, that there's no expiry date on knowledge, you know, and uh, there may be bad, may not, maybe incorrect knowledge if you go back, depending on what the knowledge is. But my gosh, people have been smart since, you know, people read books on Socrates and so on, and, you know, Attila the Hun, you know, to get some ideas on management and so on and so forth. You just have to update things. So I figured, okay, just like I wrote those articles, it became a book. The book became seminars. It, it just off into products. I talked about having a proper planner, then why not I develop a planner then? It became little pieces of it. So, hey, I could do this on a regular basis and put out a newsletter and knowledge that I would normally put in a book would go in the newsletter. And I can put this newsletter on a USB flash drive, and I think I was probably the one the first ones to use these flash drives. And here I am, now already old at that age, maybe 20 years ago. But I remember buying flash drives and saying, you know, I've got an awful lot of information here. I can convert to PDFs uh, very easily and put them on flash drives, and it'll be a resource kit for organizers. And I sold it for $495, I think, or something initially. Uh, now you can probably pick it up for 15 cents. But, but the thing is, why? Well, because useful information that they can use. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. Forms that they can use in their seminars and workshops. Quizzes and action plans that they can use. Information on how do you, uh, you know, documents on how do you, how do you start up a, a workshop? How, how do you run a workshop? And so, and, uh, and ideas on, you know, on 101 ways to promote your business or whatever. And things you've picked up and used yourself, you know, and little ideas to like uh, uh, the one I got from somebody 50 years ago and, and tried it out about 50 years later where they said, if you sell somebody a product and you ship it out to them, if you put a letter in there thanking them very much for their order, you really appreciate it, and then offer them, in, in fact, uh, uh, to show our, uh, our appreciation, we would like to offer you our new book on such and such. Uh, at 20% discount. And when you sent that, or whatever, you change the product, 10% of the people who bought your first product will buy the other one. I thought, I've got to try this. I couldn't believe it. I fell off my chair. It worked. <laughs> Maybe it won't work today. And in those days, we didn't have uh, electronic. This is before that time. This is uh, where we, everything was shipped out, you know, like Amazon. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. Amazing. So you can you know, keep on going and just with the information, never throw, throw anything out until you can say, how can I use this again? I love listening to your stories. And uh, I can listen to your stories for hours. And specifically because the way you tell the stories is they're your personal experience. 
and there's all these lessons inside of them especially about selling information that's one of the biggest industries nowadays people selling information uh, people wanting to be an influencer understanding things that they feel the world needs and in your journey and it didn't matter whether the internet was already there or not i hear that the same principles apply you pay attention to what you like and what the people around you like and you found it, find a solution and many times you can just repurpose it use this one thing and apply it in a different situation and as long as you stay focused and keep going on that path new things keep coming up yeah and you'll always have a purpose in life because i've i've got purpose because there's still so much to learn and and, and to, to apply it in some way now maybe i'll apply it to the volunteer organizations that i that i work with but it's still applying and i get just much of a kick out of it they say do what you love and the money will follow and that really is is true it does i love that i love that mr harold taylor thank you so much for sharing your story for sharing your wisdom with me and all the listeners of the influential executive podcast now i know that there are many millennials listening many purpose-driven entrepreneurs people who are out there to make the world a better place what is one final piece of advice you'd like to pass along well i guess my advice is that you uh, uh, use all the technology you make use of the technology that comes out you know but make sure you control it and don't allow it to control you uh, like when things come out they sort of take over our life uh, we answer the phone why because it rings you know uh, uh, we speak to the person why because he interrupted us uh, it's always it's sort of reactive mode i think the thing is in the a book i'll be working on next is be proactive you know in other words uh, you know you take control of how you use it and uh, people won't laugh at you people they, they laugh at, people don't laugh at me because i use my planner it's some right planner you know and i, I put in there everything after the fact even you know, I, if, like I don't know. All of a sudden, suddenly we, we find ourselves in this restaurant, and we're going to have a have have a lunch or something. And when I get home, I didn't have my planner with me. I take out my planner, and I put in. I had lunch, and, uh, and, and from the bill, I put the phone number down in case I want to go there again or something for lunch or for dinner or whatever it happens to be. And it becomes my my journal, you know. And cursive writing is good for the brain, by the way. And uh, you know, printing. And uh, keyboarding, uh, I'm sure it does, it, it changes the brain too, but not in the same way as cursive writing. And uh, there's things changing in schools, and I was not teaching cursive writing anymore, you know, because why? Well, you're just keyboarding, that's all you need now. But what does the brain need, you know? Uh, it has to be, maybe there's something else that you have to do that will, you know, uh, stand in for it and uh, do, do the same thing. But just make sure that. Uh, you know, you don't throw out the, the, the baby with the bathwater kind of thing. Some things that were developed 100 years ago are still the best thing to use today. It depends on what, this is the situation. Now, I'm not saying a planner is good for everybody, but a planner is a planner. An iPhone is a computer. There is a difference. And uh, planners, my gosh, I can't get over that tactile feel of it, you know, and flipping it open and seeing in there. And, and I've got now 30 of them that I can go back and say, what did I do 29 years ago? You know? <laughs> so when you're old, you can go, you never lose your memory. It doesn't matter if I can get Alzheimer's tomorrow. I still don't know. I look at my planners and say, see, <laughs> see what I've done and what I didn't do. But anyway, uh, just uh, have an open mind and uh, just don't stop everything. So, oh, heck, that's, you know, we used to say that's 50 years old. Now you can say that's last year's. Well, <laughs> last year's, take the good from last year as well. Very nice. Thank you very much. Where can people go who want to stay in touch with you? Yeah, well, I have a website still. My son is in Mexico and he still keeps it on up and uh, don't have many products for sale, I think. But things like that book that I mentioned is still there and you can download it, of course, as, as a PDF. I hope you don't buy the book itself. I have to ship it out, you know. So <laughs> uh, the, the whole thing is to get downloadable products so you don't have to, have to really ship them. 
there are a few things on there, and there's articles. I write article. I try to art- I write an article every well, sometimes maybe every two weeks, sometimes every week. And uh, because I'm doing a lot, it's not the priority, so I may skip. You know, I may say three weeks gone by and there's no article on there, but there are hundreds on there. There's about 300 articles on there as well, and you can search for a topic and come up with them. And, and that website so is uh, there. is it HaroldTaylor.com? Sorry? Is the website HaroldTaylor.com? Harold, oh, it's TaylorInTime.com. TaylorInTime.com. Yeah. Got it. Always in time. TaylorInTime.com. <laughs> Harold. Or just, yeah, and I'm, or, or just Google Harold Taylor Time Management. If you put Harold Taylor Time Management, you should get all kinds of things. Maybe a, a, a video that's 50 years old or something. <laughs> Some very funny YouTube videos. I saw that you were having a really good time on stage demonstrating what chaos yeah. in the office looks yeah. like. That's that's a classic. <laughs> well, I did that, Alexander, because the, the, somebody said one of the points is if, if, if you're going to do something, find out what everybody else is doing and do something different. And uh, I found at the time that a lot of people thought time management seminars were boring. You know, oh my gosh, sitting through this thing, Credo's principle, parking through the blog, going on and on and on. I thought I'd live it out and make it up like a desk in an office. And this is what's happening. And when people are laughing, they're not laughing at me. They're laughing at themselves because they're doing the same things that I'm portraying. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> Harold, thank you very much. I had a great time listening to your stories. I'm sure our listeners pick up several things that remind them of what's really important and maybe some habits that are ready to be picked up again. So thank you for that. Thank you, Alexander. I appreciate the opportunity. And that was Harold Taylor. I love his stories. I think in the entire interview I asked two or three questions. And other than that, I was just hanging by his lips. I love the personal stories and I love to hear how all the old principles still apply today. Even though the technology is different, we're all connected through the internet, we still live in a world that is designed by humans. And we see that we still we are successful using similar principles. Now to stay in touch with Harold Taylor, you heard him, go to taylorintime.com, pull with articles, You can learn about his books over there and I'm sure there are ways to stay in touch with him uh, available on that website. That's it for today. I hope you got some inspiration. I hope you heard something, you learned something that you're going to implement today. Make that change. What is that habit that you're looking to improve? Because you all heard Harold, time is life and life is everything. Have a beautiful day.